welcome to UO Today. I'm Barbara Altman, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Our guest today is Dara Goldstein, who is the Francis Christopher Oakley Third Century Professor of Russian at Williams College. Her research areas include Russian poetry, modernism, Russian avant-garde art, Russian cultural studies, and culinary history. A self-described foodie, Goldstein is the founder and editor-in-chief of Gastronomica, the journal of food and culture. The journal, begun in 2001, uses food as an important source of knowledge about different cultures and societies, provoking discussion and encouraging thoughtful reflection on the history, literature, representation, and cultural impact of food. Among Goldstein's published works are the following books, Feeding Desire, Design and the Tools of the Table, 1500 to 2005, Culinary Cultures of Europe, Identity, Diversity, and Dialogue, and The Georgian Feast, the vibrant culture and savory food of the Republic of Georgia. Goldstein engaged in a keynote discussion titled Gastronomica at 10 Years at the UO Food Justice Conference, which was hosted by the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics on February 21st, 2011. Dara, welcome to UO Today. Thank you for having me. We're so pleased to have you here, and I know many, many people on campus were waiting your, awaiting your arrival with great pleasure. You've been a busy woman, but I'm really glad you took 30 minutes to talk to us. And I want to launch with a great big question. How did you end up pursuing food as a scholarly interest? It seems inevitable to me because I've always been interested in food. And when I started reading Russian literature in earnest in college, I was just astonished because the descriptions of food and what the people were eating and how food characterized the different players in the novel uh, was something I hadn't encountered in French literature or English or anything else I'd read. I think part of it is that because there was so much censorship in Russia, a lot of what would have been uh, erotic scenes were sublimated through the food, and the food became rather eroticized. But um, I thought when I started graduate school, I would do my dissertation on food in Russian literature, and this was a long time ago, and I was laughed down the corridor. I was told it was not a serious topic. So I think that uh, many years hence, and it has been many years since I was in graduate school, I'm still, in a sense, trying to show those professors that, yes, it is worthy of intellectual inquiry. And for the first uh, years of my academic life, I was very dutifully doing more conventional scholarship in Russian modernist poetry in art. But I couldn't let the food alone. I wanted to write about what was very close to my heart, to my palate, and so I was writing cookbooks and doing more conventional scholarship. And it really uh, kind of came to a head in the mid-90s. The Soviet Union had collapsed, and it was a time for reassessment. I was reaching middle age, also a time for reassessment. And I thought, I want to bring these two poles of my life together and my scholarship can involve food. It doesn't have to be distinct from it. And in fact, it's really been interesting to think about it because the, the kind of work I've done in culinary history in many ways is much more difficult because it's not always documented. So you really have to dig in archives. You have to go through a lot of oral histories. You have to look through estate account books, the kind of mundane documents that you don't really think about using um, in some forms of research. So it uh, is uh, quite an exercise in scholarship. <laughs> Has it caused you to teach the courses that you teach at Williams now differently than courses you took as an undergraduate and graduate student? Yes, I teach two, I teach three courses that I absolutely adore. Uh, two are related to food. One is Russian culture and cuisine, and it's basically a culture course, but through the lens of food. So we start by reading travelers' accounts from the 16th century, coming to what they called this rude and barbarous kingdom, because the Russians ate onions and garlic, and they expressed their pleasure viscerally by emitting sounds from all different parts of their bodies. And these were mainly German travelers who were quite offended by that. But seeing uh, food ways and the way the other eats uh, is 
a very interesting way to enter into culture. And we read cookbooks as social documents. We read a lot of the Russian literature that so captivated me as an undergraduate. And I have just developed a new course in the sociology department on food and society. So that's really uh, a direct extension of my work in food now. I'm assuming that you have no lack of students. They must be cramming your classrooms. Yes, well, they're trying to. I, I limit the number just so it's manageable. So you feel that it, things are integrated now, your writing of cookbooks, the editorship of Gastronomica, and your tra more traditional <laughs> scholarship? Well, I, I, I can't say that everything is perfectly integrated. I think within my own life it is, but I still feel that food studies as a discipline within academia is not fully understood. I don't know uh, that it ever will be. There are, are certain inherent problems in that because what I love about it is it's so multidisciplinary. Really, everything you think about, everything uh, touches on food, and there are ways to in enter into it through anthropology, sociology, psychology, history, economics. The list could go on. But um, that means it doesn't have its very own methodology. And when you're in academia, that's suspect. So, so you <laughs> still have to switch hats and address different audiences. Yes, and I actually like addressing different audiences. I feel that uh, one of the gifts uh, to me from editing Gastronomica is that it's gotten me out into the world. When I was solely working on Russian modernist poetry, which I really love, and um, it has made me who I am, but it is kind of a conversation stopper at a, <laughs> a cocktail party. You know, it, it would all come down to that morpheme when I'd been studying a line of poetry, and this is where the meaning really resides. I finally discovered it. And y you can't, the world doesn't open up, but with food, everyone wants to talk about it. Uh, it is so much a part of who we are or what we aspire to be. And so I've met wonderful, wonderful people. I've been able to talk to different kinds of audiences than I normally would. And I learned from it, and I love that. I wanted to pursue that question of audience <coughs> with you a little bit, both for the public appearance you made in the Food Justice Conference and then uh, with regard to the magazine. But first of all, for the roundtable discussion you were involved in about the 10-year anniversary of Gastronomica, mm -hmm. you said that there was a wonderfully diverse audience. Could you talk about that a bit? I was so energized. I looked out at, it's a big, uh, they call it a ballroom, but it's a big uh, lecture hall, and there were so many young people there. I know I'm at a university, this is where <laughs> young people study, but they don't always go to lectures, and certainly not at 9 o'clock in the morning. And they weren't all students. Um, a lot of them were somewhat older. They were farmers, active farmers, trying to engage in a new way of life. Uh, there were a lot of activists, people who uh, work with nonprofits, working to uh, help with organic farming or with food banks, uh, looking at issues of hunger, uh, particularly in the Pacific Northwest. And they all are so deeply, I could just feel the energy. They're so engaged and they want to get out and do things. And I really felt that this is where it happens. Uh, this is where things can be jump-started by having so many different people engaged in different professions, getting together and talking. Because there's a modicum of um, academics there, too, and uh, scientists. Of course, some of them are academics, but some are in uh, scientific think tanks. So it's a very, very broad range of people. I'm not surprised that you drew that kind of a crowd here in Eugene. It's the perfect community for the kind of work you do. Well, I, it's really thanks to Alison Caruth who put together the conference and who invited all of these different constituencies. Talking about the, the magazine, Gastronomica, that also addresses a pretty broad spectrum of different kinds of readers, doesn't it? It does. And it's interesting, uh, University of California Press some years ago did a demographic study, and I thought that it was going to be academics reading it, and it's not. Maybe academics don't want to pay for it. <laughs> I was trying to figure out why this was so, but um, it is 
a broad swath of the American public, a lot of artists read it because uh, the artwork and the photography, that is so much a part of what Gastronomica is. A lot of uh, people who didn't realize they were interested in food but picked it up and became engaged by the articles read it. So uh, some of my best contributors have been people who, say, discovered it in their dentist's office, started picking it up and thought, well, even though I don't write about food, I have a story to tell. And those, to me, are uh, some of the best contributions because it's not from a perspective where I need to write about food. Food is the catalyst for uh, whatever the story being told is. And you go into very interesting and often very dark places. And it's a darkness that I like. I think that one of the things that I wanted to do with Gastronomica was uh, maybe not so much be a corrective, but an alternative to the trade magazines, which I love. You know, I love to sit and read about the wonderful trips to different places and the restaurants and the recipes, and I clip them avidly, and I contribute to the magazines too. But it's really more about lifestyle. And I want Gastronomica to make readers think more deeply about issues surrounding food, and some of them are painful. It's got a very broad range of contents. You've got scholarly essays in each essay. <laughs> there, in each issue, there's fiction, poetry. Um, the the visuals are absolutely arresting. I can tell you from the beginning of the, the project, you've put a lot of emphasis on the artwork. Mm -hmm. it, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the covers, actually. I went to your website and had a look at a number of the covers. And what you were just saying about the dark places that the discussion of food leads us, that comes through in those covers. Is That must be deliberate? Yes, I love the covers. It's my favorite part. I don't have to do any editing of words and <laughs> any wrangling. Um, but also, they're just so immediate. When you see something on a cover, it literally is in your face. And I try to choose images that are either quirky or that uh, take you almost into another dimension or that are suggestive of something else. So uh, very rarely have I had like a traditional still life. It, it might be something that uh, is a commentary on gender or on class or on race or on you know genetic modification. There could be any number of things. Um, Just a couple that I noticed that caught my eye immediately were um, one of a fried egg with a big oh, shiny yes. yolk that almost looked like an astrophysics photo. It looked like something uh -huh. from outer space. And then the one that I was most intrigued by was a cherry pitting machine that looks like it could be an instrument of torture. torture. And there's all that very red blood-like juice spattered all over um, the place. You are my perfect reader, Barbara. You totally got both of those. So the egg was last May's cover. And it was also the cover that I chose for the Gastronomica Reader which is a book that came out for the 10th anniversary of Gastronomica and a sort of anthology of some of the best articles that appeared over the past 10 years. I obviously couldn't fit in all my favorites. Uh, and I wanted something that was joyous. Uh, I talked about the dark side, but I don't want to neglect to mention that the other thing I wanted to do with Gastronomica is remind people that food's about pleasure there's so much prescriptive um, moralizing uh, information being put out. You should not eat this. You should not do that. Uh, if you eat this micronutrient, then you will live to 93. But you might live to 93, but um, for me, I'm not sure I want to live to 93 without pleasure. And so uh, many of the images are meant to evoke just the lushness and the sensuality and the deliciousness of food. But the cherry picker, uh, or the cherry pitter, I should say, does remind me of, of a very scary torture mach machine. And yet, what I hope the next association is is that we think about the food chain and slaughtering of animals, but even with fruit. In order to get what we want for our sustenance, there is some 
uh, destruction involved. It's not all just, you know, life is just a bowl of cherries. Well, it is, but it also involves uh, people picking the cherries who are not earning sufficient wages. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of issues. A bowl of cherries can be very messy, yes. in fact. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> when you just mentioned the people picking produce and fruit, I was reminded of a couple of the letters that you write at the beginning of each issue, mm -hmm. the letters from the editor. And I was really struck by your introduction in those letters of the kind of ethical, political dimension of food that sometimes gets lost when we're thinking of it as a kind of a high-end pleasure product. Mm -hmm. But you had one on the human element. Who picks those crops that we enjoy in the locavore movement, for example, not locals. Mm -hmm. And there was one on making good food available to senior citizens in various um, residential facilities. So you are really putting up in the face mm -hmm. of your reader um, what you said were those darker aspects of the whole thing. I'm trying to. The struggle with those letters is that I don't want to sound didactic or preachy. I want to bring the issues to readers, but I don't want to be moralistic in any way, um, even if that's how I'm feeling. <laughs> so that part is hard to get the right tone. I think it's a struggle for me. Yeah, I can imagine that you write those very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> My husband edits them very carefully. That's the real secret behind uh -oh. them. If you <laughs> have an in-house editor, that's I a do, big yes, and help. He's, he's wonderful. Have you been surprised by the massive success of Gastronomica? It has won so many awards and endorsements from so many major people in the food movement. You know, I feel as though it has been such a whirlwind for the past now 11 years that I haven't really had a minute to stand back and assess it all. Mm -hmm. I think at this 10-year anniversary, I'm just beginning to uh, take a deep breath and think about, well, now gastronomic is about to enter adolescence. Where should it go? And think about what it is and, and what it should be in the future. So am I surprised? I, I that isn't a question that I really asked. I'm pleased, I think, would be my answer. Fair enough. I'm wondering if it is the success of Gastronomica, however, that has really <coughs> catapulted you into some really surprising professional endeavors. And <laughs> among those, you're a, se you're a series editor for California Studies in Food and Culture, which is a University of California press series. Yes, that actually predated Gastronomica. That's why I brought gastro or the idea for Gastronomica to University of California Press, because I already had the relationship. Got it. OK. What about, though, um, you w are, were on the board of directors of the International Association of Culinary Professionals. Yes. Is that a direct result of No, that also, um, I got involved with the IACP when my Georgian cookbook won the Julia Child Award. And so that was, again, my surreptitious culinary life before I even became involved with Gastronomica. And then it just happened that I uh, served on the board for a while. The one thing that did directly come out of Gastronomica is my work for the Council of Europe. Oh, could you talk about that a little bit, yes, please? Yes, it was amazing, one of the most wonderful things I've ever done. I still continue to think a lot about it. It was a, 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 a team of about six of us international uh, scholars getting together to think very broadly about how food could be used to promote tolerance and diversity in the world completely idealistic, you might say completely unrealistic. But when you think about sitting down at the table, breaking bread with someone, it's at least a step towards overcoming that sense of otherness. You know, um, I talked about the travelers to Russia in the 16th century. If you do sit down with someone, then you begin to understand a little bit more and you've shared something profound. So that was the idea behind it, but how to put that into action is a much larger question. What came out of that work with the Council? I edited a book called Culinary Cultures of Europe, uh, Diversity Dialogue, and there's a third word in that title that I can't yes. quite remember I think we now. have it right here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, cul Culinary Cultures of Europe, Identity, Diversity, and Dialogue. Okay. Yeah. And it was a very interesting exercise because 
the whole idea of the tolerance. There were all kinds of battles, for instance, between Azerbaijan and Armenia because Armenia had two more pages in the book than uh, Azerbaijan did. So th the whole concept kind of fell apart in, in practice. But it did make all of the countries that participated, and I think there were close to 40, think about themselves in terms of their culinary identity. And there were fascinating essays, some more sophisticated than others. And then, to me, that wasn't enough because there was a book and it was beautiful, but after you've published a book, then, you know, what's next? So a few years ago, I went to Israel to work with Arya Nadler, who was one of the men on this uh, team that the Council of Europe had convened to really try to put into practice these ideas about food as a catalyst for change and for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Needless to say, I did not solve the Middle East crisis in six weeks, but we got uh, some interesting uh, discussions going uh, to find ways to get children to share meals and to see uh, food not so much as Israeli food, Palestinian food, but perhaps as a pan Middle Eastern food that everyone shares. So there is, even, despite all of the uh, awful things going on and the political differences, there is a point of commonality. Were you able to see that at a micro level around the table with those shared luncheons for kids? Yes, you could. And the hope is with the children that they will carry that with them into adulthood. But of course, until the government gets behind programs like this, it's not really going to affect any profound change beyond you know, the level of the occasional encounter. Who was helping you? set up those encounters between Palestinians and Israelis? Was it a cultural ministry or, gov or other government um, ministries? Well, or? I there is um, an organization in Jerusalem that will take uh, people to the West Bank to see what is actually going on there. But it was also through uh, scholars at Tel Aviv University and, and Hebrew University who helped make some connections for me. I'm sure it was not easy, but it must have been endlessly interesting. It was. Yeah. It was really. And um, I, w I want to do more, but somehow that's uh, not happening right now. I, w I would need to be back there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you're taking some time for reflection now that Gastronomica is in its second decade and in its <laughs> adolescence, so to speak. Yes. Have you thought about changes of direction or any subtle changes in format that you might want to put into place? Well, one of the things that frustrates me, uh, because Gastronomica doesn't have a staff, really. Um, so there's the print magazine, and it's basically all I can do to get it out four times a year. It feels in a certain way grandmotherly in that it is this beautiful, it's like a book every four, uh, every yeah, every three, three months. But there isn't an active web presence. We have a beautiful website, but it's not changing. It's very static. And what I would love to do is have the backstories to the stories that are published in Gastronomica, because I can't uh, fit everything in. So more imagery that uh, tells a, a deeper story or an interview with someone who might be tangential to whatever the article was about, but giving another perspective on it, and then starting a dialogue so that it becomes a dynamic place where people are actually talking about the articles, and hopefully the articles spur them to talk about contemporary issues in the world of food. But that, at the moment, is all a pipe dream. What's it going to take to make that happen? Money. <laughs> of course. In a word, <laughs> yeah. Uh, to be able to hire someone who can uh, make it happen, because I I can't uh, take that on. In addition, at the moment, you're yeah. getting lots of coverage in other people's blogs. I, I've I've read little entries here and there about people going to hear you speak or looking at the magazine. Oh, I so don't follow them, so I'm you'll sure have you to have send time. me that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I can see why you'd like mm -hmm. to bring this all home and put it on the official site of, of the magazine. Yes, and I also think that uh, the younger generation is more attuned to the web. And so it's very important if I don't want to seem 
stolid, or if I don't want gastronomica to seem stolid, that it needs to have a more um, up-to-date arm. So it's not that the journal itself will necessar necessarily change in format, but I want it to uh, expand. It sure makes sense that it would give you infinite room to provide those backstories you mentioned, and yeah. it would lend itself very well to increased visuals um, to yes. back up what you have in print. And I have so many uh, artists and photographers I want to feature, and there just isn't enough room. There, this may be the last question we have time okay. for, but I wanted to get back to something I heard you discuss briefly on a radio interview here locally. The, our station KLCC interviewed you as part of the Food for Thought program. And I heard you say something that was very thought-provoking for me, which was your, uh, you mentioned, and correct me if I get this wrong, I'm paraphrasing, you mentioned that you hope that this new interest that so many people share in what we eat, how we eat, where we eat, um, and all of the issues associated with that, that you're hoping it doesn't become so commonplace as to become less urgent? Oh, Did I get that more well, or less right? more or less. I think that um, one of the things that is happening now is that there's so much about food everywhere, just everywhere you, or maybe it's just me, but I don't think it is. Uh, I worry that it might reach a saturation point and when things reach a saturation point, then people tune out. They just stop listening. So even if more important information is being conveyed or a wonderful new book is published, people say, you know, food was so 2011, and now it's time for something else. So I, I just hope that it, with the, the frenzy of interest in food, I hope it doesn't uh, make that happen. Well, I think if you continue to use all kinds of different media and include the variety in those magazines, we will all follow you <laughs> to the ends <laughs> of the you, earth Barbara. and back. Oh, thank I'm you. sorry to say we have to stop there. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much for having me. It was really fun to talk to you. Well, I'll be following the, the progress of the magazine, and I'm going to be giving the subscriptions oh. to a number of people <laughs> as gifts, I think, oh, now nice. that I know more about it. So thanks again. Thank you. We've been speaking with Dara Goldstein. Professor of Russian at Williams College and Editor-in-Chief of Gastronomica, the Journal of Food and Culture. She participated in a keynote discussion titled Gastronomica at 10 Years at the UO Food Justice Conference, which was hosted by the Wayne Moore Center for Law and Politics on February 21, 2011. Thanks for watching and see you next time.